Hi, I'm Anna. I am a travel nurse and first year student registered nurse anesthetist, SRNA. And I'm Chrissy. I'm a nurse anesthetist, CRNA. And we are the co-founders of Confident Care Academy, a comprehensive online resources for new critical care nurses. All right, so today we're talking about atrial fibrillation for new critical care nurses. So yes. we're going to just start, we're just going to start right off with the story. So, yeah, have you ever had a time when you were at work as a new grad nurse and you just got reamed out for something that maybe didn't really require a full reaming? Has that ever happened to you? Yeah. Yes, yes, raise your hand. Okay, we're raising your hand if you're listening to the podcast, we're both raise your hands. And comment uh, your story if you're on YouTube. Yes, yeah. Comment, yeah, for our YouTube friends, please comment below. We would love to hear it because, guys, you are not alone in this one. Nope. So, you know, Anna and I were talking about this. We're like, hey, like, you know, we really should have a competition about atrial fibrillation. It's so common, um, especially in our new to ICU membership. We have so many new grad nurses who are in either CBICUs or CCUs, meaning cardiac intensive care units, whether it's surgical or medical. So obviously AFib is like one of the mainstays of their wheelhouse, Super right? Cool. When I was a new grad ICU nurse, I was in the HBICU myself, RIP. And uh, one of the nights that I was on night shift, you know, pretty freshly off orientation. Yeah. I had only been a nurse for like, I don't know, less than a year. I remember having a patient who went into AFib with RVR, that's rapid ventricular response, for the first time, like without having a preceptor with me, right? Right. So, you know, for those of you who aren't familiar with that, like disease process, atrial fibrillation is basically when the top of the heart is essentially quivering, that's fibrillating, and then the bottom of the heart sometimes responds and like tries to match the atrial rate because most of those beats get conducted to the ventricle. So that's that's what RVR is. And so then that's like a very fast heart rate, right? So too fast of a heart rate, you don't get enough of a cardiac filling time. You don't get enough blood out of the heart because the heart doesn't fill enough. You it all lose. goes back to your uh, cardiac output being stroke volume times heart rate, right? So if your stroke volume is smaller and your heart rate is higher, cardiac output is going to be lower, which is part of what's going on with AFib. Anyway, right. yeah. Yeah. Too high. yeah, when the heart rate goes too high, eventually that gets compromised. So back to the story. So basically this patient has AFib with RVR and that is, I'd say, an urgent situation. It's emergent only if the patient's blood pressure becomes unstable, right? So either way it needs to be addressed quickly. Either way you need to do something about it. You want to call your provider. You want to get help in the room, especially if you're a new grad. You want to get a 12 EKG, all those good things. However, you know, um, I was in a kind of a weird situation where the patient's blood pressure was stable-ish. I'd say like low 90s systolic, like not really ideal for this patient, but not actively crashing. Right. Called the doctor who was like moonlighting overnight. She didn't answer the phone. You know, I took like a quick lap to the office, which was kind of nearby. Like I had someone keep an eyeball on my patient. I was like, I'm just going to look for her like in the office over there. Didn't see her in the office. Didn't see her in my pod or the pod next to me. I didn't want to go too far and like walk around the unit too long and like leave the patient. But you know, I spoke to the charge nurse and I was like, hey, I, I can't find this doctor. Like, right. like how, do you, how do I get in touch with her? And she's like, oh, just page overhead. Yeah. So I was like, okay. So I just page overhead, like, you know, doctor so-and-so can you come to pod one? And she comes flying out of the woodwork and she's screaming at me. I know. She screams like, why would you overhead me for AFib? This is not an unexpected outcome. I went, ah. And then she kind of like took a deep breath and she slowed herself down and she turned it into an educational moment, which I appreciated the education right. that came next. And she was right. And I learned a lot that day. So, you know, the main point of, that she was trying to communicate is that after patients have cardiac surgery, there's about a 35% chance on average of going into atrial fibrillation. Right. After heart surgery, the risk goes like least to greatest. Cabbage, it's like around a 30% rate, it's like 10 to 30%. Mitral valve, um, I'm sorry, any valve repair or replacement, it's like a little bit higher. And then yeah. the highest rate is for people with a valve and a cabbage. Yeah. Um, so those patients need to be like up to 65% of some studies. So like it right. is an expected adverse event. So even this an adverse event, like there's, you know, there's different things we do to prevent it. We keep patients on beta blockers. Yeah. You know, we keep their electrolytes within certain ranges. We do all these things, but it's not like unexpected. It's not an emergency unless the patient's crashing. So maybe an overhead page scared her a little bit more than it needed to. And, you know, I still think it was good that I got in touch with her the way that I did. I, Probably today wouldn't change anything anyway. I'd probably do it all the same way. But so yeah, and this I would say for 
this should circle back to the provider communication video that we have on YouTube and on the podcast yeah. about tips and tricks that are going to make your life easier as you're communicating with people who are sleep deprived and maybe are in residency or fellowship and are working 60 to 80 hours a week, she isn't attending. which is not ever appropriate. We don't endorse people. We don't endorse lateral violence. We don't endorse or support bad physician or practitioner communication <laughs> habits. However, there are a few things that can make your life a little bit easier as a new grad as you are learning to navigate a brand new space with really critical patients. So I'm going to link this video up here. You can go watch the uh, provider communication video. And if you're on the podcast, it's just a few episodes back. But that being said, the story is, you know, because you got chewed out for honestly an appropriate intervention. It's an urgent, not emergent situation, which I, we're going to have a podcast about this too. It's really hard to know the difference as a new grad. And when something is abnormal, AFib with RBR is abnormal. But are they actively about to code? Probably not. Probably not. So, or even like one quick little tidbit, could you have overhead paged and be like, and been like, hey, not this emergent. is Chrissy with room 27, non emergent, AFib, RBR, could the provider come to the bedside? So then, like, they, yeah. then they understand when a provider hears the word non urgent, they usually de escalate a little bit. But again, you shouldn't have to tiptoe around people, even if they're sleep deprived. <laughs> All of that being said, AFib is really, really common, and we get into this in the membership. So Chrissy and I uh, co-founded Competent Care Academy, which is the one-stop comprehensive online resource for new critical care nurses. So it will have the link down in the description below for the membership, and then we have a lot of free education here as well. But why is AFib common? So a lot of reasons why this happens after cardiac surgery. One of the biggest reasons is the patients are already at risk for pre-op because of their own disease processes, right? right. Especially the arm um, disease, vascular, vascular path, all of them. Exactly. Diabetes, everything. Yeah. Exactly. And like we just filmed an episode where we talk about mitral valve regurgitation. Yeah. And how that. Did, yeah. There you go. Little. <laughs> so in that episode, we talked a little bit about how when there's regurgitant flow going back into the left atrium, and the left atrium gets dilated, it changes the myocardial cells themselves and the left atrium, and it changes their conductivity and it puts them at higher risk for going into atrial fibrillation. So like that is like a very common reason. Like a lot of these patients have chronic MR and we're already at risk for it. A lot of these patients had suboptimal perfusion to the myocardium because of coronary artery disease and different vascular diseases. So that already puts the myocardium at risk before surgery. Yep. Then after surgery, you know, we have um, lots of inflammatory mediators floating around in the pericardial space. When we do heart surgery, we cut open the pericardial sac to get to the heart. So once that's cut open and like, you know, anytime you have surgery or any type of wound to the body, right, controlled or not controlled, you're gonna have inflammation. It's so, honestly a surge response. It's not a surge response to the point where it's, it's not sepsis, but you have all of these inflammatory factors after a surgery because it's a physician inflicted injury. You are cutting open the chest. Yeah, it's an injury, right? Yeah, it's an injury. So there's a lot of inf inflammatory factors. Yeah, so there's inflammation of the heart itself. If, the heart, if there's an open heart surgery, that's why the valve repairs have a higher rate of AFib than the cabbage alone. And then second, you also in the fluid itself, it's floating around that space. There's just like a bunch of like washout and inflammatory mediation. It's like sitting there just irritating the heart. It doesn't have fluid and electrolyte changes going yep. on. Massive shifts throughout the surgery then after. And yeah. then the surgical site itself, right, is a pretty big risk factor for atrial fibrillation. Yeah. Um, so talking yeah. about the valves being the highest and then valve plus cabbage being, the, well, the valve plus cabbage being the highest and then the cabbage because of the conduction. It's more of the fact that like since the heart actually has to get cut open, mm -hmm. that like it's just causing like like more inflammation to the tissues themselves. Yeah, which is wild. So it is pretty common. And then I think as new grads, especially if you're working in the CBICU, if you hear that 30% of post-op cardiac surgery patients are likely to have AFib, that's helpful framing-wise in your mind to know what to expect. But then that kind of leads into, so what do you do for management for AFib? Like what what's what is the move? I think a lot of so units hard. have protocols, right? So like, I think that, so one of our protocols was like immediately, we just could throw up a gram of magnesium and it was just on override. And I, you just pull it I it. and it was like, we had these standing order sets where it was like magnesium and potassium. We could give PRN whenever it fell out of certain ranges. Like less than or two for like magnesium or less than 3.5 for K. Right. Or something so like even that. if your MAC was like an appropriate level, you would admit, immediately throw up a gram of math. That was like what we did. So we do a 12 kg, throw up a gram of magnesium. And then while we were asking pharmacy to get the amyo load ready, and that's amyo to run. 
So usually we do an amiodarone load, what was it, 150 milligrams over 10 minutes, and then a drip at one. Mm -hmm. Wow, it's been a long time. She still got it, boom. She still got it. She's still a CBS eater. It's been a while, gang. And then we would check lights too, right? So if you like have an A-line, you could just like draw a super gas. We had this like I-STAT machine right on the unit. We could draw our own gases so you could see if the potassium was low. Yep. You would only correct that if, you know, if it was low. What other things would we do? You could cardiovert if the patient was very unstable, but I don't think that's like, Super common. I feel like most of the it's time. Pretty common. It's. I, I feel like it's pretty common. You feel um, like they would cardiovert a lot. I feel like we almost so never cardiovert. It's typically not the post-op cardiac surgery patients that you cardiovert. No, no, yeah. I mean the post-op yeah. cardiac surgery patients. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm being unfair. Other patients who go into atrial RBR for whatever other reason, any other number of factors, especially if they're not post-op and they're likely to throw a clot. That's when you're pretty quickly. You're. I feel like the medical patients who go into atrial RBR were faster to cardiovert. Yeah, that's true. So it is interesting. I wonder why that is. Not but I also that. find that with most of my experience being cardiac surgery, that oftentimes you can fix the AFib RBR before you get to a place where the patient is sustaining in the 160s or the 170s. That's the thing. They're I pretty responsive like... to amio loading typically, or to electrolyte fixing, or sometimes even messing with your pacemaker if you still have wires. You know? Not only that, but I think that one. Now that I think about it, one of the reasons why I think that we didn't see the AFib going high enough where the patients became unstable enough where it required an immediate cardioversion is because they had a beta blockade. Almost all cardiac surgery patients all get all beta blockers before, during, and after surgery. Well, not during, because they have the morning off, but Which anyway. brings up a good point. If your patient is hypotensive coming out of the OR day one, so this is usually post-op day one that they're getting all of their pills, right? So they had their surgery, they came out at 6 p.m. last night. You're the day shift nurse, you're coming in, and your patient is still on Levo and Epi, and they're a little bit hypotensive, you're not gonna hold the beta blocker without talking to your team. Oh yeah, you wanna ask yeah. about that, definitely. Because beta blockades, are, it's one of those things that you're giving not for blood pressure management in this patient population. Right, you're giving it to help prevent arrhythmias, so yeah. that is important. And if they're already on other pressors, there's different ways to keep their blood pressure up, then usually the goal is to still give it. Yeah, um, but that, that would be a, that would be a talk to your provider before holding cardiac medications for post op Good, patients. safe blanket rule. Yeah, just ask a question. Ask a question. So, um, you know, moral story here is AFib, RBR, not as common to see the rate go up super high because they are beta blocked. Yeah. And then we are keeping tight control of their electrolytes typically. So. I feel like it was kind of rare that they were unstable enough where we needed to cardiovert them. Usually we were able to just do the amio load. But that does make sense that in other patient populations, maybe that's not the case for them. And then you know, a rapid onset yeah. AFib, super high rate, they might need a cardiovert. Something version. that's coming to mind here that's also maybe not as big of a factor, it just came to mind, is like, okay, well, in your medical patients who are presenting suddenly with AFib RBR, your post-op surgery patients are anticoagulated often as well. So, I mean, I don't know. Are you at a greater risk for throwing a clot if you're a medical patient coming in not anticoagulated and that's part of the urgency behind it? Well, I feel like you're usually treating for rate control, right? You're treating to make sure that the patient's stable and then also you don't want them to throw a clot. But So the blood, the risk of throwing a clot, so what Anna's talking about, throwing yeah. a clot. Sorry, we'll go back here. <laughs> So, okay, you know, atrial fibrillation, right? I mentioned the top of the heart is quivering, right? There's two really important things to know about this. The first important thing to know is that not only when blood flows to the heart does blood pass through the atria, through the mitral valve, and then fill the left ventricle and then get squeezed out into the body, right? Like we already know that. The top of the heart and bottom of the heart are always squeezing at opposite times. So when the ventricle is relaxing, the atria is supposed to squeeze to kind of like dump out all of its blood into the ventricle. Right? So it's not just passive filling, there's some squeeze involved. And we call that squeeze atrial kick. And that's really important to getting that ventricle nice and full so we have really good cardiac output. So when you go into atrial fibrillation, a lot of that blood kind of gets left behind. You lose that atrial kick. So you get about, what is it, a 30% reduction so 30 in cardiac output as a result? Wow, really pulling that out of my pocket from the old days. But um, never leaves you. Never leaves you. <laughs> so you know, but so not only did you lose that cardiac output overall, like you get some reduced blood pressure, all those things, but that blood, where do you think it is? It's still chilling up there in the atria, it's just stagnating. So when it stagnates over several days, you're at higher risk for clot formation in the left atria. And the problem with that is it can go to the brain and cause a stroke. You know, that's probably like the biggest risk that we worry about. So, you know, you if a patient were to come into the ED, for example, in AFib, 
they don't just straight up cardiovert those patients because they don't know how long they've been in AFib. Right. So we have very specific guidelines for when the onset of AFib is and if you're allowed to cardiovert without anticoagulating first or not. So typically, um, I believe it's a three-day rule. I think it's a bit less than three days and they are able to cardiovert, but don't quote me on that. Always look things up like that. <laughs> so that brings up, my mind just was kind of jumping place to place, but then that circles back you're totally right. You do want to make sure what you want to make sure is that you're not intent or is that you're not throwing the quad. That's the whole point. The point is that you want to make sure that you're maintaining as normal blood pressure that's compatible with life. You're rate controlling if possible. And by rate controlling for the new grads, that means we're focusing really on the heart rate. You want to be your rate, down the heart rate. Slow down the heart rate. And you also want to be considerate of the fact that there might be a clot there. You want to try to avoid have, like giving a patient a stroke by sitting a clot. That yeah. Be sitting and more importantly, if you cardiovert while a clot is in there, you're essentially at a greater risk of throwing that clot to the brain. So that we don't just cardiovert AFib patients willy nilly. Yeah. And that is why you will often see like medical management being a first choice because a lot of our patients, if they come into the ED, you don't know how long they've had the AFib unless they're already on a blood thinner. And then even then, usually like a lot of times if we're gonna do cardioversions like in anesthesia, I have days where I just do like 10 cardioversions in a row. Yeah. And um, we'll do a TEE first. If yeah. we, if they like, if we're not sure how good their anticoagulation's been or if they just got started on it. I was in pre-op the other day, pre-op patients for that specifically. You yeah. have to get a 12 week before and you do an echo and then they'll go and do- They roll out a plot and then they do the cardio version. Yeah. Which is super interesting. But yeah. then that also, I feel like it circles back to knowing what medications you're giving and why you're giving them. Yeah. Right. Because so, that's what you're going to see more often. You really need to know the medical management. Yeah. The medical management, you're, you've got your antiarrhythmics class, you've got your amiodarone. You, how does amiodarone work? What is it working on? You need to know the conduction of the heart to see where that is going to work. And then, you know, why are they beta blocked? What is, what type of beta blocker? Is it a cardio selective beta blocker, metoprolol versus other medications? And then, Electrolytes. So these are the things that you will become very familiar with patients coming in. Oh, they're an AFib. They're a chronic AFib. Okay, well, what does chronic medication management for AFib look like? So you start to look that up and you look up what the home dose regimen is. It really, we're talking about this in the last video too, but just the spirit of curiosity. You should really just like want to know more and look these things up. And what's really interesting about the heart is that it's a pump and you know, if, if the top is not pumping right, how are you going to get it to pump correctly? If the bottom's not pumping right, how are you going to fix that? If it's, uh, if you've got a pipes issue where it's dilated out, okay, what are you going to give to make that work? So you can really, you can really kind of figure out what you're going to do, but just be asking a lot of questions and looking a lot of stuff up here. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And then, you know, zooming back out to like when you understand the disease process and like your own patient populations, you can avoid situations where you are getting yelled at in the middle of the night for overheading the doctor right. to please come to the bedside or, you know, or maybe you should still overhead them, but use your communication skills and just yeah. say, not emergent. Not emergent. That being said, like, you know, like, what would you do if you're on your ground today managing it? Like, I feel like the first thing you do is panic, right? And then you stop yourself, you take a deep breath and say, okay, all right, what do I do? It's like, you say like, tell a friend, phone a friend, right? So like grab a senior nurse, grab a charge nurse, like whoever's closer. And then um, like it's like, hey, can you like call the provider for me? Can you help me get a 12 lead EKG? You start delegating, right? You shout out to the standing in the hall. Would you mind bringing the 12 lead in? Like, you know, you, you want to try to avoid leaving your patient. You can, you can delegate somebody else to find a doctor, call them for you. Again, figuring out the electrolyte management, doing things within your unit protocols. Like don't go just like, drawing potassium levels if that's not normal for your unit. Like we had standing orders for all that stuff, right. right? Don't just start hanging magnesium if that's not a standing like protocol in your unit. Like that was something I was supposed to do. I don't know if you've been on units that did the same thing. I've been on both either or. And this, I think in the first, one of the first episodes we did about, I think new grad survival tips, I'll link that up here, is you should never be alone in the room with a critical patient as a new grad. Yeah, always phone yeah. errands. Oh yeah, you should delegate, you should loop in your charge nurse as soon as possible, and you need to communicate what's going on. So, you, and you also never should be calling a provider without a patient picture to give to them, because then what they're hearing over the phone is just your panic. So for this patient, we actually practice this in SimLab, this specific scenario. Oh really? As new grads, yeah. They, cool. they gave us an AFib RVR patient and they wanted to see what we were gonna do. So what are you supposed to do? Get a set of vitals if there's not a set of vitals already 
see if the patient is conscious, because conscious versus unconscious is going to change what you're going to do in this situation. And you need to also call, it would be better if you knew what the labs were when you called the provider as well. You don't have to, but that would be a good thing to know as well. So you need to know, are they conscious, first of all, is it stable or unstable, and what's their vitals as you go? I would say, that being said about the labs, you know, I would say be cautious with that advice because knowing what the labs were like at 5 a.m. that morning, like, don't draw labs in the lab and wait until the lab's back oh, no, to call no, the no. doctor. Like, that's not what anatomy is If there's all. a recent like, lab within an hour and it's reflective Like, if you already relevant. know. Or, but honestly, how I would really call do first. it yeah. is I would call first. Yeah, because you want them to, like, already be coming over and working. I'd say, like, hey, I drew the and sent the labs. Like, let them know what you did, right? Yeah. Think about that as far communication situation. Hey, Dr. So-and-so, non-emergent, but Mrs. Smith yeah, is in an AFib, RBR, rate of 120, blood pressure is 90 over 60, she's conscious and mentating, I drew a gas, someone's running in for, for me right now, I have someone else um, getting a 12 lead to confirm, and you know someone is, and someone already called pharmacy to ask them to start making the embryodrone, I don't know if you wanted to order that or not, would you be able to come to the bedside and take a look at the patient? Perfect, perfect. Because that shows the provider that you know that the patient has X, Y, Z thing happening and you've already done steps within your scope to address it and you're looping them in so that they can then place whatever orders they need to. Yeah. They're also not hearing that. That's very different from this phone call. Hi, Dr. Jones, can you please come to room 14 now? I, they're in AFib. Clip Which I think up. is probably what I did. Because if, <laughs> I know I overheard something. Because like if, they're in, if they're in AFib, click hang up and you're four rooms down placing an, an art line, you don't know if that patient is conscious. You don't know if they're if they have a blood pressure that's compatible with life. Yeah. So you can communicate that it's the same patient scenario. It's just the way that you communicated it a little bit, which would be helpful. Yeah. Also, when you're on orientation, ask questions of your preceptor. How would you say this? How would you ask this question? Yeah. And it's really helpful for you to do it. You shouldn't have your preceptor doing things for you. But it is good to ask advice for phrasing because yeah. that can for somebody who's worked five nights in a row, you know. And I agree. I once again, I don't think it's appropriate to snap at a new grad, but suboptimal. However, valuable lesson here: you can do harm reduction for yourself. You can <laughs> harm you reduction. Can, you can reduce yourself. your chances of getting snapped at. Not that you should ever get snapped at, but you know, it can still be. That's going to happen. Just prepare. It's going to happen. It's fine. At some point, it's fine. Yeah, no. The sooner, the sooner that you brace for it, the better off you'll be. <laughs> and you'll live. It'll and be you'll live. And guess what? The world keeps turning because at the end of the day, you and I are just tiny specks of dust on a rock <laughs> in a big universe. Yeah. I feel like that's an amazing conclusion. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, guys. Comment, so. um, comment what you would like for us to talk about next time and then join us on the membership. Yeah, we would love to see you guys over there. We dive way deeper into this stuff. We're going to get into like the action potentials, the conductivity system, the conductive system, the conduction system. Yeah. We're going to talk about all, yeah, all the things, all the anti-arrhythmics. Like, there's no way to talk about this on a podcast slash YouTube. Like, we'll be here for three days. But thankfully, we're doing it over the course of several months in the new <laughs> ISU membership. So, confidentcareacademy.com. We're going to link it below. We would love to see you guys there exclusive videos every month, super deep dive education, live Q&As, case studies, downloads, hangouts, resources. It's awesome. You're going to love it. Come see us there. And we'd love to hear from you. Thanks, y'all. Bye.